So yeah, thanks everyone for coming to our talk today. Um, we're going to talk about some key techniques that we've developed for e-commerce search ranking at Mercari, which is actually Japan's largest C2C e-commerce marketplace. Um, and before we get into the talk, we'll wait a second for these slides to appear on the... Uh... There you go, monitor here. So some quick introductions. Um, again, I'm Tio. Um, I'm one of the founding members, actually, of Mercari's ML search ranking team. Um, and joined today by my colleague, Chinggis yes, Oi. Uh, konnichiwa, everyone. Yes. I'm Chinggis, today with this guy, um, same team. Um, of course, happy to see everyone, and of course, happy to be here in the first place. Yes, definitely. I'm happy as well. Thanks, everyone, for having us. Um, and a quick overview of what uh, today's talk is going to look like. Um, we're going to open up just real quick with what um, Search at Mercari actually looks like. I'll get a little bit into data set construction, offline eval, and then I'll pass it off to Chinggis for the next two um, bullet points of model building and then debiasing. And then I'll wrap it up at the end with some takeaways and um, a sneak peek into what's next. Uh, so Search at Mercari. Um, I wanted to start a little bit with what Mercari is and start with our vision. Um, originally founded over 10 years ago with this vision of a global marketplace where anybody can buy and sell. And so our mission is to make that a reality and to make that as easy as possible. So everything that we do, all the features that you're going to see here in this talk are um, in service of that mission. Um, and then some quick numbers for scale. These are numbers from our last fiscal year. We have about over 23 million monthly active users. Um, and then just for reference, that's about one in four adults in Japan. So it's pretty big. Um, and then um, very large percentage of users, of all e-commerce users in Japan, um, have reported using Mercari before. So we take a huge segment of that population. And we have over 3 billion item listings in our catalog. And then the total sales across our um, platform in the last year alone uh, was about $6.5 billion um, USD, which we take about a 10% rate. So that's going to be our profit off of that. And again, uh, Japan's largest CDC e-commerce marketplace. Um, and before I move on, I just wanted to emphasize our UI here. Um, what sets us apart is really the simplicity of use of our service, again, to make it as easy as possible to buy and sell. So when you search for something, all you see actually are pictures and then prices. And sometimes if the item's already sold, that little sold marker. So that's as simple as it gets. And it takes about two clicks. You click into one of these listings. You click here. You agree. And you buy it. And that's it. It goes straight to your door. So um, that's kind of our competitive advantage in the e-commerce space in Japan specifically. Um, so going to search at Mercari, it's really the most fundamental way that users discover what's on our platform obviously, is with most uh, search systems. Um, and it's super performance critical. So our search backend gets tens of thousands of QPS, uh, P99 latency in the low hundreds of milliseconds. Um, we have two stages for search. So we have a retrieval stage powered by Elasticsearch. Uh, we also have a post-retrieval um, MLV ranking component um, completely decoupled from Elasticsearch. Uh, and that's going to be the focus of this talk today. And then this is a schematic of um, our backend system, very simplified version of it. And so we actually gave a talk last year on this is what our search system looked like before re-ranking. And everything in the colored section is the ML ops um, and the infrastructure that we needed to get um, to establish something with that we could deploy models to production. Um, and so this is something that we really wanted to emphasize as well, which is um, even though we want to work in the ML and we have these great ideas, we need a way to get this into production quickly and keep it in production for A-B tests and in general giving value to our users. Um, but as uh, we hopefully convinced a lot of people last year, um, we've done this successfully. And so now we can focus on the you know, more interesting part, hopefully, this year, is what happens exactly in any one of these boxes with the machine learning component. And um, just a quick overview, um, LTR is actually a key component of like most modern search and recommendation systems. Um, we just train an ML model to learn some ranking functions. So we have um, a SERP ranking that's uh, given from the Elasticsearch retrieval stage. Um, machine learning magic happens here, and then we return some ideal listings um, ordered to the user. And so actually, give me one second to change this slide a bit. Um, OK, great. And so I wanted to get into what ideal actually means in this context. And so um, for the retrieval step, it's basically saying um, we want to focus on relevancy, but relevancy of query to um, you know, uh, what's in our catalog and like the search uh, terms that we have um, in that search query. 
versus um, here, we're actually ordering on relevance in a more vague sense, so again, ideal. And we kind of emphasize that it's more of like what the user intent is. So that's what relevance means in that second stage of our ranking system. And I actually had a great talk with uh, Tommy Neubauer from Quicks on this. And like, what actually is it that the ML ranking function is doing? What does ideal really mean? Um, in our situation, e-commerce context, um, our users, what they want out of search is to easily discover, find what they're looking for. Um, and if they're a seller, to quickly um, show their items, surface those items to those users. Um, he was joking that, oh, like as a user, I want my items to appear at the very top of the list. And Yes, that is what our users want. And I think this is actually a problem that we had before re-ranking, is that our users started becoming SEO experts, um, which is a lot of friction to being on our platform. We wanted to remove that for them. So everything you're going to see here with like, what, what our goal was with this ML system was just to remove that need for them. They can just list an item, search for items, and then just be on their way. Um, and this is a, like an example of what that looks like um, at a high level end to end. So on the left, we have a SERP, which is directly from Elasticsearch. And on the right was a re-ranked SERP from one of our A-B test models. Um, and so what's important to note is that um, all of these labels here that we have, we use implicit judgments, which I'll get to in a second. But these items were actually really far down in the SERP um, before re-ranking. So we see that our model, if this is a good judge of what users actually want, um, is good at upranking those things. And this is just the top 20 of results. And so then the question is, how do we do that? And so. I'm going to make a strong claim that the key to building an effective and robust system is good evals and data literacy. Um, and maybe not too strong, because it's something that's already been emphasized in a few talks uh, this year alone. And before I get into this, a uh, special shout out to OSC, uh, Daniel Wrigley and Mickey O'Brien especially. They gave us some key search quality trainings last year that led to a lot of the innovations that we're going to show next. And so um, hopefully we get to make them proud with this talk. And so this is the first stage of our ML um, journey, is the data set construction. And so we started with implicit judgments. And so um, I'm not going to get too much into the details of data set construction other than to say that we have relevance labels ordered from um, most and least relevant for our use case. And so we um, derive this directly from our user search logs, of which we have um, a large amount of data. And we started with the most basic direct user interaction logs. And so nothing um, inferred in this case. We know exactly what a user purchased, um, what they added to cart, um, comments, likes, and then clicks on items. And because we have a lot of data, um, for feasibility's sake, we started with just five days of training data and then the following days, um, one day of validation data. And that's just to prevent something called um, temporal leakage. And so that was one big learning that we had, is originally we weren't splitting this up chronologically. And we were getting really good results. Um, but then we realized that it's because the model was learning kind of future interactions. There was some data that was being leaked. And so it wasn't actually predicting very robustly into the future. Um, and then the next step was, again, good evals. And so why do we want good evals? Well, we want to be able to test these things offline, these ideas we have, before putting them in really expensive A-B tests. And then being able to do that increases the odds and the magnitude of the success of those tests once we put them um, online and um, user-facing. And how we do that, again, uh, we use standard search quality metrics, so in this case, NDCG, which for those who don't know is basically uh, a normalized value, which a one is uh, really good, the, the best search um, ranking metric that you can have, the best search ranking ordering, I should say. So the closer to one, to better. Um, the closer to zero, the worse it is. And we also did something that I don't think is quite emphasized enough, which is these qualitative spot checks. And so we can't do this for all SERPs, but at least some mechanism for being able to uh, what they call vibe check the model. That's what the kids call it these days, of just making sure that, OK, your numbers are going up, but do these rankings actually look reasonable? Um, and then I just wanted to say that this is really, really important here. So you can have a great data set, but how do you know what features um, and improvements that you're making? Um, you need this feedback loop to be really fast, and you need the numbers that you're getting to be really effective and very correlated with what you'd be seeing online. And I also wanted to mention that uh, Peter, in his talk, he mentioned he emphasized really going all in and some kind of um, evaluation frameworks and really offloading a lot of work there. And I think that was a key to our system as well, as being able to do this quickly. And um, for us, weights and bias has really helped with that. Um, and you'll see some graphs in a second. So we implemented this in that weights and biases dashboard. And so going back to vibe checks, these qualitative um, evaluations, sure enough, we had numbers that were going up, but then the vibes were off. 
we saw that over time, um, it looked like our model was getting good at predicting purchases higher in the SERP, and then over time, uh, less and less so. And we couldn't figure out why. And then what we realized was that these things here, clicks, um, were very noisy. Surprise. And so what had happened is that clicks were um, very overrepresented in our data set, and so our model was getting really, really good in click-heavy NDCG, um, but really bad at all of the other labels. And so we did this really profound thing, which is we stopped including clicks. Um, and that helped a lot. Uh, the one problem with that, actually, is that, again, those were overrepresented, so now we had a really sparse data set. Um, we'll get to how we address that in a second, but at the very least, this helped us with that first problem. So now when NDCG went up, it was a lot more correlated with our online metrics. Um, and then, speaking of online metrics, uh, NDCG actually wasn't enough. We started going all in on custom metrics, um, and I wanted to emphasize, um, starting with just this one, purchase NDCG specifically. Um, that was really, really key to us delivering strong business value. So this we've implemented in just the last year, and we have now a 100% hit rate on our A-B tests. So if this number goes up even just a little bit, we are very strongly optimistic that our A-B test results will be stats to SIG um, on even the most fuzzy North Star metrics to the business. So in our case, we use buyer conversion rate, um, average transactions per user. Even though those are very hard to move, um, purchase NDCG is very highly correlated. So this is really, really uh, key to us doing that. Um, and actually, before I move on, um, this actually credit goes to Alexis Kativa from Vinted. Um, we had talks with him last year um, at last year's Buzzwords. And this, for some reason, didn't occur to us to do this in an e-commerce context. So um, shout out to him for that inspiration. And just a quick overview of why it matters. And so this would explain a lot of our issues originally correlating online and offline results. So we see in model training getting better at these classic NDCG metrics over time. So um, like NDCG over the whole SERP, top 10, top three. But then when we instituted this uh, purchase NDCG, we realized, oh, wow, this is actually getting worse over time. And so now we have um, two A-B test variants that we were monitoring over time. And if you looked at the classic metrics, you would think that the blue model is actually better at all of the NDCG metrics we were looking at, at the time. We would have released the blue model. But now with purchase NDCG, the story changes. And so what we actually did in this case was we released the uh, pink model, which actually did have statistic performance in the A-B test. Um, one more thing to emphasize is we only use that for model selection. So we still train the model to optimize for NDCG over the relevance labels I showed you a second ago, um, right here. But we did model selection. So that makes sure that our AI search ranking system is robust. So it still picks up these other signals, but we do make sure that it still impacts the business metrics. Um, and that will lead into my next slide here, which is the next step we did was something we're calling high signal filtering. So we removed those noisy signals which allowed us to do something really interesting. So we have purchase NDCG now, and we realized that this was actually a huge game changer for us, as now instead of filtering to SERPs with only one label generally, now when we filter them down to purchase labels, which are super sparse, um, the model does a lot better. And because they're sparse, it actually gives us this benefit of we can now feasibly train over a whole month of data and use seven days for validation, which actually solves another problem that we were facing was time seasonality effect. So, if you noticed before, there were only five days of training, one day of validation. You don't even capture a whole week. And the day that you're training or you're validating on wasn't even in your training set. So you lose a lot of um, patterns that you would see in a normal full week of data. So now we solve that problem by having four full weeks of data uh, to train on and then one week to validate on. But then now we have another problem. As I mentioned to you earlier, you have clicks. That's great. But then those are the most everything else, you know, unless you're doing a, such a great job, you're not going to get these purchase metrics or purchase labels very often. So now you have sparse labels in your data set. Um, and another interesting observation that we had from people talking, um, talking to people at last year's Buzzwords was we're also in this um, C2C space where we have unique items. So even if you're um, selling the same exact t-shirt, size, color as another person, our system sees those as two unique items. And so what happens is if you purchase something here, and another user sees the same exact SERP, they may have wanted to purchase this as well, but they don't get a chance to. So their SERP does not have this label at all. You miss out on a lot of information. 
So we did this really clever thing, not so very simple actually, which is now we have these other user purchase checkout、um, and completed purchase labels, and now your SERP becomes a little more dense. And what's really interesting that I didn't mention earlier was that clicks are preconditions to all these other events. So a user had to have clicked on something in order to have these events、um, attributed to it afterwards. So in this way, we don't have these false positives of this wasn't actually relevant to the user, but it was in these labels. Because they clicked on it, we know it had to be somewhat relevant. But now it's not noisy because some other user did purchase it, so it's at least purchasable in that vague sense. Um, and then finally, something that we're testing out very re recently is something that we're trying to imply as a good listing. And so again, we have clicks on items,、um, and we have these preconditions to say, okay, they're not just raw clicks. So now we add clicks on sold items as a label. And you may ask yourself, why? What does that matter? Why even show sold items to users? They can't purchase them. That has no impact in business metrics whatsoever.、Um, actually, funny enough. As mentioned before, so this is what that looks like after adding that label. We have these buy side experiments, and on those dashboards are some seller side metrics. That just because why not throw everything out there and see what sticks? And then we had some sell side metrics going way down. And one hypothesis was is that the whole point of showing sold items in a SERP is to inspire you if you're buying, if you're just discovering. Oh wow, someone sold this jacket for this much money, which is about like $500 US. I have the same exact jacket in my closet. I should just sell this now.、Um, you don't have that opportunity if you don't see these sold-out items. And what our re-ranker was actually learning, surprise, was that these sold items can never be purchased. And so before this, it was actually ranking these sold items all the way to the very bottom of SERP because why? They, they're they're the most irrelevant items possible. So now we're adding this back to the mix, and then. Maybe we can report after, after、um, our results here,、um, but this actually ended up being、um, improving purchase NDCG by itself. So either way, it's a win-win, and then we'll see. Hopefully, with seller side metrics,、um, it goes up as well. And then the next step, which a few people have teased about in this talk, I,、um, Stefana、uh, Serban had a great talk yesterday on this of using LLMs as quasi-explicit raters. We have not worked in this at all, but it's something that we're really interested in doing. So、um, this allows us to encode things that users won't ever give us information for. It's not scalable, but again, going back to potentially sell-side metrics,、um, what items could inspire users to list their items if they see it? And something else too is that we have、um, a problem in most search contexts, which is you have spammy items. So it makes your search results feel spammy if you have, for instance, five of the same imaged items from the same seller because they're selling five of the same product. It doesn't make the search result look great. If we had some mechanism to say, oh, a listing that makes you feel like you can trust our marketplace better, that would be fantastic. But this is, at the moment, pie in the sky fantasy. Hopefully next year we can let you know the results of our testing here. And with that out of the way, I will pass it off to Chingis for the model building <laughs> section. Yeah, thank you, Tio. Yeah, so now I'd like to talk about model building. Although I'm not sure how much I should talk about model building in the room of ML engineers, but anyway, it gives me a good transition into my next topic. Yeah. So、uh, as you might have guessed, in as in every ML problem, there are a lot of ways to approach that problem. And in learning to rank, there are three main guys: point-wise, pair-wise, and list-wise approaches. And as you can see here, if we want to Say that a cookie is more relevant than an apple, and then an apple is more relevant than pizza. Then、um, we can try all these three guys. So、uh, at Mercari, we differentiate our features into two major categories. First is context, context features, and then we have document features. And、uh, some examples for context features, of course, query. If you don't have a query, you're probably ranking with your eyes closed. But for document features, we of course have a very specific document-based、uh, features such as price, title, freshness, or recency.、Uh, yeah, and then we have some SERP statistics for context to give a bit more context、uh, of what is happening. And then、uh, we also have, of course, some feature transformation. Since we are Japanese marketplace, we use Japanese-oriented、uh, tokenization methods such as Mikap.、Uh, And then for SERP statistics, we use z-score normalization,、uh, of course. And since we are lazy engineers, we just slap、uh, log1p transformation into numerical features, 
which is a very convenient and it's a very easy way to scale your numerical features. Uh, also, sometimes it helps to uh, combat uh, skewness in uh, skewed distributions. Yeah, and this is a very high level overview of our model architecture. As you can see, it's a very basic MLP model. And of course, as you might have guessed as well, we spend about 5% of our time into model building. And a lot of this effort is going to data and uh, evaluation as well. So now moving on to uh, model devising. Uh, first, uh, so before we added our uh, ML Sun into production, we, of course, didn't have any ML-based ranking at all. So what we had is, of course, uh, Mr. Elasticsearch that would act as a solo ranking function that would produce uh, the item rank. You know, um, in Elasticsearch, you can come up with this very co complicated and sophisticated boosting equation, what we say, that would uh, boost certain documents on certain features. Um, yeah, and as, as time passed by, we realized that is that feature might be also very noisy because item having a very high item rank might not be, it, it might not be an indication that that item is also the most relevant. So what we came up with is to use a, a very lazy regularization method as well as, as to just uh, throw Gaussian noise into that feature and uh, try to regularize the model so it's not very over-focused on that certain feature. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, of course, uh, the cherry on top is user behavior. So there are two main guys that we always deal with when we build our evaluation methods or uh, when we build our data is noise. And of course, uh, as Theo mentioned already, noise are very, uh, clicks are very noisy. It, it might happen for whatever reason. It might be very unexpected. Like, um, you might be very tired at night, and you might be very uh, very exhausted, and then you might be looking for Pikachu, and then for some reason you tap on Pichu while thinking about Raichu. Mm. So it's very uh, unexpected, as you might have guessed. And some clicks might, have, uh, might even be uh, accurate despite of relevancy. But then, uh, as Theo also showed, uh, when you gather a lot of data, we, we can assume that we can uh, average out noise because uh, we assume that uh, a noise is a random behavior. But then there is another guy called bias, and he's uh, more evil than noise, mm -hmm. because we assume that bias is a very systematic behavior, and there are all sorts of biases, like a position bias is when a user tend to engage with the documents that are placed uh, on top. And then, of course, we have a, a very uh, huge number uh, of engagement labels for top documents with comparing to the documents that were uh, in the lower positions. And then we have item selection bias and representation bias. Uh, yeah, and uh, in this talk, we're going to talk uh, specifically about position bias. Uh, and uh, there is a very uh, common and very famous probabilistic model when uh, that people start with when they deal with the position bias that says a probability of click is, depends on both probability of relevancy and probability of uh, observation. So that means uh, if click occurred, uh, let's say if click was genuine, then if click occurred, then that means both that the click is relevant, that the item is relevant, and the item was observed and examined by user. But however, when the click did not occur, it doesn't necessarily mean that the item is not relevant. It might also be because of this guy here. So it, it, it might also mean that the item was not examined by user. Yeah, and that's a tricky part. So how we can estimate position bias? So there is a very naive approach called random shuffling, uh, which states that you can uh, randomly shuffle top-end documents, and then you can um, record clicks and aggregate this, all these statistics, clicks per rank. Then you normalize, and you can, you can see that some items receive much more engagement on the higher position. And as uh, deeper it goes, and as uh, in a lower position, it might, uh, it might get um, very few clicks or very few uh, engagement actions. Uh, so however, the problem with this approach is that 
it might hurt user search experience because if you just uh, go there and random keep randomly shuffling the items, your users might be confused. Like, what is happening? Is your ML model sound even is even working? Uh, so that's why there is another very convenient approach, which is called intervention harvesting. So in a real-world production system, many interventions take place uh, during A-B tests. So that means when you uh, perform A-B tests, you, you might have multiple variants. And uh, the assumption here is that the randomization, the random shuffling, the randomization is, comes from uh, the, the variance during A-B test itself. So there is a um, run inherent randomness uh, in your uh, ranking models that you're A-B testing. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry for putting so much text. Uh, it was either me putting this text or turning this slide into a uh, math quiz. So uh, but I tried to explain as simple as possible. So what we do here is um, we collect data from our A-B test. We we gather uh, data from multiple A-B tests. It might be three A-B tests. It might be more. And then we try to find documents that were shuffled during those A-B tests uh, because we used many variants. We, we experimented with different ranking models. And then we, for each query, we compute sort of click-through rate at a certain position. Let's say we compute click-through rate at one, at two, at three, at four. And then we also compute uh, the expected click-through rate for that item given the context or given the query. And then we normalize, uh, normalize uh, the click-through rate by the expected click-through rate. So we would have a, uh, the uh, normalized values for that document at position 1, 2, and 3, and 4. And then we would aggregate that statistic again to kind of have a, a single uh, weight that represents the bias for certain rank. And the idea is here is that we only need propensities that, is, that are proportional to the true observation probability for learning. So instead of computing the real probability of observation, we hope that if we compute something that is proportional to it, we might be fine. Yeah, and that's what we got after we edited that formula and put in uh, our data in it. So we see that the items that are placed higher in the rank, they get much more engagement. However, uh, as user begins scrolling, they might engage mo much more with the central position tha than uh, the, the items that are on the left on the right to that. Uh, and that's a very huge problem for us. So because if, if we put, just put a bias data, the bias labels into our model, then we will get a, a bias ML model sound, and then it's a it's a vicious circle, and it's a never-ending loop of uh, biased data and biased model. So how we deal with it is uh, once we compute the weights for position bias, we, first we use a TensorFlow uh, at Mercari, and then uh, for TensorFlow, there is a very nice package called TensorFlow Ranking, which allows you to uh, give your document weights as a feature. In our case, document weights are the estimated position bias. And then what it does, it, it uses those weights as a sample losses. However, what we found, um, yeah, and, and those weights, the, the weight for your sample here for, to multiply with the loss is computed as here. So it's just a multiplication of the weights you give the labels, and then it divided by the sum of your labels. Uh, so however, instead of uh, just going with this approach, we find much more useful if we apply those weights on the labels instead of with the loss. And we will show you some offline results. So we see that uh, when we apply those estimated position bias on the labels instead of the loss, we get much better results. Because we found that when we used it as a sample loss, it ended up over-penalizing over uh, over and then uh, ended up favoring tail queries instead of uh, the head queries. And uh, the tricky part is that when you do any A-B test, uh, the world itself is not very balanced. 
so the, the head queries always dominate your uh, metrics, KPI metrics. And that's a tricky part. And that's why uh, we didn't uh, see much success with this approach. However, anticipating some questions for the other approach, we also um, did, a, a, we, we've seen some uh, good results uh, online as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jingus. And now I will end it with some takeaways and what's next. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, last year we talked about foundations to get and stay in production. Um, that's the most important thing to work on because all this uh, fun ML stuff we couldn't have done at all. I mean, we could have done it, but we wouldn't have shown value of it. We would have been you know, turned off immediately and moved to some other team. So once we have that, in this talk, again, we talked about tight um, eval and data enrichment feedback loops. And so I think that was the emphasis was whatever system you have in place, get the right metrics and the right eval chassis so you can iterate quickly and then you can test these things into production. Um, even the data debiasing work that Chinkus mentioned, that was a very deep dive that we wouldn't have been able to justify beforehand. But now that we have the system, we said, okay, yeah, you can just trust us because these metrics are going up. Hello, Mr. PM, purchase and DCG is going up from this thing. Let's run it. And then we did. Um, and then I kind of wanted to talk a second about um, the talk title, which is robust search ranking for radical growth, right? Like this kind of hyperbole, like what does that even mean? And so I talked to our PR team and said, oh, like how can we talk about the impact of this feature? Um, and they were very supportive and they said nothing. You can't say anything, nothing that isn't on our IR page. And so um, I said, you know what, you're right. Uh, I have to, I'll talk about it more vaguely. So um, I pulled this from our IR, IR page, and about here, this little dip here is when we released some of these AI features, the most impactful ones. And so I can't claim credit for this huge jump because that's not at all. This is the product of many teams working together, um, many AI, non-AI features. Um, but we were a pretty significant part of this jump. And again, I can't talk in exact numbers, but it's on the order of a few magnitudes greater than my salary today. So um, that's what I mean by radical. And then what's next? And so really a great thing about starting simple, having this proof of concept, and like starting from like specific use cases is now um, we talked about we have a foundation to get things into production. We have systems for tight eval and data enrichment. Um, this is common across all AI projects at our company, and now we have both uh, proven use cases and proven methods to apply to other projects. And so this is something that we're going to work on next, and then you know, maybe next year's buzzwords, maybe not, but um, stay tuned for more. And um, also, again, emphasizing don't disdain the small things. Really just start somewhere, and I know a lot of other people at buzzwords this year had the same thing, because then over time, once you build and improve these systems, then you can have radical growth. Um, and then acknowledgement. So even though Chingis and I were the ones presenting this work, again, this is not just the work of two people. There's a whole team behind this and a team behind us as well. So these are just a few people that we wanted to thank from our team. Um, and with that, our presentation is concluded. So yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks a lot to you and Chingis for this great presentation. Do we have any questions? in the audience, yes we do. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question about the relevance estimation uh, training set building time. So you mentioned you have the different signals, so like the sale the uh, and the others, and you select just the most, I mean the one that is highest in the ranking basically to give the estimated relevance. Have you considered like, rates, like click-through rates or sales rates, rather than the absolute label, such as it was a sale or it was a click. I, I mean, you, you discarded the clicks then, but anyway. Yeah, that's the question. So have you considered that to use instead of just, for example, if it's a sale, mm -hmm. so query document, it's a sale, mm -hmm. to count how many times? Because you said you have unique items, but anyway, I guess you you consider like a feature vector that probably will repeat, yes. I guess. Okay, yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, we have these binary labels, was purchased, was not purchased, um, clicks themselves, was clicked, was not clicked, too noisy, but something like click through rate on an item as, as a label in this case. So like maybe there's like a weight where like click through rate of 100% is a very strong label somehow and a click through rate of zero. Yes. 
Okay. Um, and so um, on one hand, we actually include that as a feature to the model. We mentioned that in last year's talk. Maybe should have mentioned it in this talk. Um, having CTR as a feature to the model um, is probably our most important feature. So we don't use it as a label directly. We actually use it as a feature to the model. So um, I don't know if that helps solve some of that um, answer. Um, it's, it's interesting, because I normally use it as the target rather than a feature. But OK, yeah. thank you. Yeah, of course. Do we have more questions in the audience? Ah, yes. Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned something about user experience, mm. right? So it's quite possible to be so fixated on the metrics that you ruin the user experience completely. So what's your approach to making sure you don't do that? Because you pointed it out quite specifically, so you've thought about it. Yes. So um, I like that question, too, because that's one of the harder questions, right? It's like this vague, what is user experience? What is good or bad? Um, did you have specific examples in our context? You, as a hypothetical user, not really. I mean, um, you gave the example of scrolling so um, and shuffling. Like, Obviously, it makes sense because it's confusing because there's no consistency. So maybe something around consistency? Around consistency. So consistency of our SERP orderings? Um, so yeah, that's a possibility. And that was something that actually was brought up of you know, maybe if you search for a Supreme Jacket, and then you have this ordering, and then you search a second later, and it's different, um, is that bad or good? And so. I think it's something that it's still an open question for us, and we're still trying to work out, which is why we wanted to start with those implicit judgments, is that's kind of revealed preference of users. And so if these labels that we hope are a proxy for user engagement and like joy, like they're finding the things they want on page one, if, that, if those related metrics are going up, we hope that there's uh, strong user experience benefits. But really, to your point, we're still looking into what user experience really means and making sure that that's up and to the right. Because even if the business metrics don't go up, um, if user experience is going down, business metrics will eventually go down. So we're still working on it. Yeah, and Les Chingis, did you have a thought? Oh, uh, no, agreed on that. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Do I see more hands? Hi, guys. Uh, firstly, thanks for the shout out to Open Source Connections. Much appreciated. Um, but also, uh, your analytics, when you're collecting all the data on uh, what users are doing with your, um, uh, your site, what's your framework for that analytics? Because there isn't a lot really that's search specific in the analytics world. Mm -hmm. I don't have a great answer to that. Um, we have vaguely a client team, which implements logging, which somehow makes it into some of our BigQuery data sets. Um, and some like pub sub topics that are subscribed to. Um, that may not be the level of depth that you were thinking. Um, is there, uh, I guess, another side of that question? I, I'm thinking more about how do you track sort of sessions linked to a query? Because okay. uh, obviously you want to see what happens after the initial query, then all the way through the, the flow, because you know, that, that they're all linked. And it's hard to track that in, in, in a standard web analytics quite a lot. Exactly. And so um, sort of like a user journey, yeah. as it were. So. We do a classic, um, we have search session IDs. And so we have, um, a, I guess, we don't have logical search sessions, just what we've defined as a search session, which is only when a user has a query and um, search condition combination, that's one search session. But if, say, they refined that query, that's a whole new search session. And so we have another team that's trying to figure out what the, you know, this logical search session is. So multiple IDs, but what like, it may be um, a 15-minute unbroken time period of searching, maybe that's a session. So we have different teams trying to figure that out, but we don't have it completely figured out. For the purpose of model training, we consider each um, search session, so the query and um, search condition combination, that's one example. So, but for analytics, another team would have a different um, definition of what a session is. So, thank you. Of course, thank you. So we have time for one more question. Thank you. Uh, thanks for, for sharing. It was a great talk. Um, so you mentioned A-B testing. Um, like, w was it central to your analysis and uh, going forward? And uh, if you used it in intensively, how, how did you use it? I mean, how were well, the criteria to, to separate the users. And so when you say central to process, do you mean like this journey the, to the success of 
our iteration cycles. Yeah, exactly. Or it was just like a plus. Um, I would concur with the original phrasing of the question. It was very central to our process. And so all of this offline stuff is for us as engineers to show the product people and leadership that these features actually will add value. But no one cares if it doesn't work in the A-B test. And even if it doesn't, you know, does or doesn't work, really the A-B test is the gold standard. That's what we um, rely on. So it was very much the centerpiece of our process. That was a quick one. We have time for one more question then. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the great talk. You know that I'm an ambassador of um, kind of the balance between um, yeah, optimizing things while debiasing stuff. So since you have a lot of products, I was wondering how, um, if you're going to incorporate into your search, let's say the balance of relevance versus experience. So I've never, I have an idea of what I'm looking for, but I've never seen it. It didn't get a lot of traffic yet, but you still can kind of um, yeah, trigger the customer to be interested in some topic and then buy something. If you wanted to handle that one. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I hope you, I understood your question correctly. I think uh, this is a huge discussion at Mercari uh, about the buyer intent. So, of course, uh, with the buyer intent discussion, we try to also cover a lot of many other topics since as Theo uh, already mentioned, we also try to show sold items. And we, the reason why we sold, uh, show the sold items is, of course, to bring trustworthiness into the marketplace. But also, we want to try to help our users uh, with their listing decisions because we want to make sure that the listing, the listing experience goes smoothly as well as the, the, their experience while searching for the item they want to buy. Uh, yeah, so we also have a lot of uh, KPIs during our A-B test that uh, we try to use, us, use those metrics and uh, pay a special attention to those metrics to ensure that the, the whole experience in, uh, at search is uh, going in the right direction. So when I say the whole experience, it includes both the ser search experience and also the discovery mm -hmm. experience that it includes. The discovery experience itself includes both the discovery of an item and discovery some of inspiration for your listing experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree with Chingis too. I think um, another thing we're working on on the buyer intent side is to say, is discovery the right mode in this context? Is the user still looking around, or do they know exactly what they want, and that would be annoying and distracting for the user experience? So we need better user experience metrics and then better ways of buyer's like, intent segmentation to determine that, uh, with, yeah, discovery or not. Perfect. Thank you. And I thank you for this question. And yeah, I guess a lot of people are interested here to continue the talk off stage. And thank you, Theo. Thank you, Genghis, for this amazing talk. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.